First of all, let me get your your perspective on COVID. Uh, cases obviously coming down, infection yeah. rates coming down, it would seem. Yeah. Um, vaccination rates obviously uh, still not going as quickly perhaps as the government would like, but have clearly had a good no. effect on uh, on the spread of it. What's your what's your take? Yeah, over 90 percent of the population have antibodies. Uh, numbers coming down because we've stopped all this ridiculous mass testing. So reduced number of false positive tests. Now the schools have closed. That's where a lot of the, the uh, false positives or positive tests that weren't, weren't actually cases were being picked up. So we're now seeing real numbers. And it's a real decrease. I don't buy into this idea that, that there's more infection out there. But this is a real decrease. And it will continue. And it makes a complete nonsense of those people who were predicting 100,000 or yeah. 200,000 cases a day yeah. so that's that's good to see and that's going to continue to drop and that includes of course the likes of neil ferguson from sage and also Sir Keir starmer who bought into that nonsense as well yeah yeah exactly um they, they've got so many things wrong I, I don't understand why so many people journalists and politicians are invested in trying to create fear and mm. promote bad news i've never understood it i understand it even less now uh we've we've rolled out the vaccination campaign i would like more young people to get the vaccine. I'm still hearing of cases, over 90% of the positive cases are now in unvaccinated people. Uh, and that's not being um, reported enough. Um, so the young people should get themselves vaccinated. And if they've got their vaccines, then there's no need to have an argument about whether a vaccine passport is a good or a bad thing. Just go and get your two vaccines, quite frankly. And then we don't have to worry about you know, the moral or ethical issues of uh, vaccine passports because you everyone will, will have their two vaccines yeah well except everyone won't i mean there'll never be a point at which it's a bit like saying there will be zero covid you know you'll never have a point where you've got 100 percent people uh, in the country who have had two vaccines because some people for one reason or another won't have them for either medical reasons or may not want to have them i find it slightly sinister that the government are kind of making this an issue in order to try and persuade people to do something because again that's right out of the sage playbook it's all about trying to persuade people to do some particular thing by threatening them with something else else yeah it's the psychological warfare this is a new thing that that, that uh, sage and the others have tried to uh, change our way of behavior mm. by frightening us with some something they've made up you see and and this we've had this for 18 months now and, and i'm tired of it i'm tired of being lied to yeah. i'm tired of, of being given um a false information uh false advice in order to change behavior um, and, and look, I, I agree, not everyone can have the vaccine. I think we should encourage everyone to have two vaccines and, and then open up, you know, the sports events and the night clubs, irrespective of whether they've had the vaccines or not. Exactly. Because of, yeah. we've, we've not yet seen a surge uh, in cases from the opening of the night clubs. It may be a bit early, but I would hope over the next week or so it will become clear that they are not the hotbed of transmission that everyone thought yeah. they might be. Well, there might even be that. But the point is, as you and I have discussed before, you know, it may well be that there will be peaks from now for every now and again. But the point is, is that because we have now got a much better way of controlling it, um, it's never going to be as bad as it was back in January because that was before yeah. people had the vaccine. So, you know, my yeah. view has always been, you know, there are, of course, there are going to be uh, days and, and weeks and particular months when when there is a spike. But, you know, so what? The point is life goes on. Yeah. Yeah, and we are we are winning this one, and uh, I, I, we need to look at some of the travel restrictions because there's there's a lot of nonsense going on there. The whole pandemic situation, which is affecting the NHS as well. Mm. Um, quite, I, I see online doctors having to work extra shifts because their colleagues are, are isolating for ten days. That's still happening despite the the exemption. So, uh, and that's probably one of the major factors affecting the health service right now. Yes. That's something you, you well, mentioned. Well, I mean, that's one of the things. I mean, the fact that the NHS is claiming that it's now in a, a worse state or a similar state of, of, of collapse as it was in January is entirely of its own making because it's partly yeah. due to the, the, the numbers of people who are uh, self-isolating because they've been pinged, partly due to the numbers of people on holiday because they're stressed out, and partly due to the fact that they've still got um, uh, spaced out beds in, 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 in hospital awards. And yeah. a lot of people are asking me, you know, why do you need to still have beds that are spaced out and, and socially distanced when that's no longer the case outside the hospital? Yeah, the problem is, Mike, uh, uh, that we now know that half the cases reported in hospital were people that didn't have COVID when they went right. in. So uh, we're talking about deaths in hospital of people with COVID people who caught it in hospital mm. so i'm still not not happy um, that the hospitals have got their act together i would i know some hospitals have tried to have a clean area and a dirty area 
that presumably staff and porters and so on were moving from one to the other. It would have been probably better to have a COVID hospital, yeah. um, keep the nightingales open, and then keep clean hospitals without the social distancing, do the lateral mm. flow test. Uh, intensively and make sure there's no COVID in the hospital. Once you've got COVID anywhere in the hospital, it's impossible to stop it spreading. Mm. And, and as I said, half the, the deaths in hospital were in people who did not have COVID when they went yeah. into the hospital. Exactly That's right. Scary. And I've said that for, and I've been saying that for months. And finally, now the the data is actually uh, backing what backing up my argument. But if that's the case, Lawrence, then sh- surely the social distancing of the beds uh, hasn't made any difference then. No, it's it's not working. For all we know, the virus is going through the air conditioning system, more likely just being carried by staff, uh, as I say, porters and so on, who are moving through the hospital. Um, but clearly, hospitals are are not a good place to be, which which is worrying. If you're a patient with cancer or a patient with heart disease, um, you've been waiting for your treatment. If now you're being told you need to come in to, to get a test or treatment, if you're lucky enough to get that far, there's still a chance that you're going to pick up COVID in the hospital. So I, I'm disappointed that the NHS have not sorted that side of things out because I've had plenty of time. Yes, exactly. To, to and you know what's coming, don't you? I mean, we'll have another winter of discontent. We'll have another crisis in the NHS. There'll be another uh, call for more money to be pumped into it because there's not enough doctors or not enough nurses. And so the, the merry-go-round begins again. And, you know, I'm getting a bit tired of the fact that nobody seems capable of fixing the problem. It's broke. The car, it's like a car with the big end gone. The engine's still running, so it's just its just going along. The exhaust has fallen off. It's a flat tire, <laughs> sticky tape and string holding together. Yeah. And now COVID's come along. You're driving in a foot of water. But as long as the car's still going and people are still clapping for the NHS, which, you see, the sanctification of the NHS means you can't criticise it. It has several effects. One is you can't criticise it. Second thing, as we say, is the envy of the world. Look at America. We don't want to be like the Americans. And thirdly, and this is something not often talked about, it creates a level of arrogance among the staff. And I think that's also very worrying. And I've, obviously, I've worked in the NHS, and I know what it's like to feel that you're a hero. Uh, you know, bear in mind, NHS staff are not volunteers. They're being paid. But the, the hero worshipping actually is not good for patients because it creates a level of arrogance. We see this at the GP level where the receptionists and, and, and some of the GPs have basically decided they're going to close their doors to everyone. I've seen cases mm. this week, a child with near infection wasn't even offered a phone consultation. I've seen patients who have been uh, denied their, their cancer treatment. I've seen people with urine infections uh, that have been mistreated or not treated. Um, and it goes on. Uh, and there has to be a level of arrogance that you can turn around and say to a sick person, no, we're not going to see you and feel that you've got some moral superiority because you work in the NHS, which is being lauded and praised, and people are clapping for you on a doorstep. Mm. And that, that aspect of, of, of the, the moral superiority of the NHS has worried me for many years. I, I no longer work in the NHS. Uh, I'm paid for what I do. Patients pay me. But they're paying in the NHS, and the doctors and nurses are being paid. It's that the money's taking a more secure, circuitous route. There's no moral superiority of, of the NHS over a doctor such as myself who's now uh, not in the NHS. Uh, but uh, all of these things add up, along with the intense bureaucracy of the NHS, mm. which slows mm-hmm. things down, that s- several levels of bureaucrats can put rules in to say, no, we're not doing this, or before your operation. I, and I've seen this. I, one of my friends had to have an eye operation. She had to have a PCR swab. But then her whole family had to isolate for three days after her PCR swab before she went into hospital. Well, what's the point of That's that? That's ridiculous, what's... isn't it? It's just yeah, ridiculous. It's, it's like it's like a sort of, but it's almost family. it's almost like it's an analog business in a digital world, yeah. isn't it? It doesn't seem to understand the modern world. That's a very good description. Very good description. They don't. I mean, and it's, it's also a literal description. There is a use of technology. We've seen. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually a fan of, of doing um, remote consultations, but the hospitals are not are not caught up with this uh, as a way of speeding things up. Um, they're still you know, phoning patients, sending letters to mm-hmm. patients, um, uh, which get lost in the post, and then the appointment gets cancelled because the patient didn't get the letter on time, and then they're, they're three months down the line. And there's no incentive. The trouble is 
Um, we all need to be incentivized. I'm not saying that we should all be paid for every patient we see. There's no incentive for an NHS GP uh, or even a hospital doctor to give good care to people. Mm. They're not even, other than self-worth and self-pride and motivation, there's really no incentive. And that worries me as well. You know, GPs are paid a capitation fee, a fee for every patient on the list. There's absolutely no incentive to do anything mm. for those patients. And uh, I know that incentivization has its own issues and doctors can be greedy uh, and, and manipulate the system, but it, it's, it's the system's broke and, and it's going to go on being like this, as you say. Another story in the winter, more political football, um, and the next election, Labour will come up with the story about, you know, the Conservatives are going to sell off the NHS to mm. Donald Trump or, or similar, as I did last time. Yeah. So it becomes too political. And you, the politicians can't actually make the change. That's the trouble. Because we, the public, in a sense, have voted for this form of NHS. Because the politicians know they can't. I mean, you've suggested in the past five pounds for every GP consultation, which probably would work mm. once you'd overcome the riots in the streets. It probably actually would work. It would decrease demand. It would raise a bit of money. It would make the NHS workable. Politicians know they can't they can't bring that in. So, uh, and they can't bring it in because people vote against it. Therefore, I say, you, the public, you voted for this form of health service that's not working. So, don't complain when you can't get into your GP uh, and. Uh, you know, someone's got to take this thing, as you said, by the scruff of the neck, because we can't have these stories every few weeks that the NHS can't cope. No, exactly right. Dr Lawrence Gurlis, thank you very much indeed.